Yeah, All right, Michael's playing games with me. Um, so yeah, this will be a quick 10-minute three-part presentation about circulation change hypothesis. This is the basic hypothesis here, changes in circulation and water properties <coughs> in the state of the street altered the plankton production in ways that have degraded salmon habitat. And we put time bounds on this from the 70s to the 2000s over the period which you've seen a lot of evidence for the steep declines in marine survival for many different stocks. And some of the evidence that suggests we do have some trends in circulation water properties include warming water temperatures between the 70s and 2000s, and that really initiated in the 1980s and, and many sites in the Salish Sea. Trends in stratification between the 60s and 80s, uh, Parker will show some evidence for that. Links between stratification and spring bloom dynamics. Uh, that's what Jan will be talking about. And one that we won't actually talk about, but actually gets you closer to the food web, are documented trends to an earlier reaper growing season for Neocalanus uh, copepods in the Strait of Georgia over the period from the 70s to the 2000s, uh, from data that were collected in the Strait of Georgia. Okay, so first bit of evidence is uh, observed monthly temperatures and salinity from race rocks. And we heard this morning that race rocks is in a great location uh, for looking at bulk water properties within the Salish Sea because of the intense tidal mixing that occurs over the sills at Admiralty Inlet nearby and in the Harrow Strait. And I just want to draw your attention to the temperature chart. And this goes from January to December, starts in 1921, and this one ends in 2011. And the dark red colors are the warmest temperatures, the darkest blues are the coolest. You see the cool winter, warm summer pattern. But an interesting aspect of the, this long history of temperature at Race Rocks and within the Salish Sea are the warm period in the 30s and around 1940, a brief warm period in the late 50s, early 60s, and then this sustained warm period that really initiated in the early 1980s. And you can actually look at some of the most extreme warm years coincide with extreme El Nino years in the tropics. And the early 40s, the late 50s, early 60s really stand out. 1983, 1998 stand out. But there's also this longer term variability in this sustained warm period from about 1980 to uh, 2010. The last two years have actually shown a bit of a cooling trend. And you don't see nearly as clean of a pattern in the salinity. The salinity has been more variable and it's poorly correlated with the temperature. And this is a um, figure taken from a paper by Maxon and Cummins looking at temperature profiles in the Strait of Georgia where they had bi-monthly hydrographic sampling going back to 1970. And here we have time running from left to right, so 1970 until uh, about 2006, from the surface to a depth of 400 meters, so you sort of look at the evolving temperature variability, and these are shown as anomalies now, not the raw data. Lots of cold anomalies from the surface all the way down to 400 meters in the 1970s, <clears throat> and you see these stripes with very warm years, and then a bigger collection of warm years and really no cold years to the end of this record. So. In the Georgia Basin, where you actually have temperature profiles with depth, you can see that this warming is extending all the way down to a few hundred meters from the surface. And again, some of the warmest years that stand out are associated with tropical El Nino events, you know, like 1983 and then 1998, um, this one with uh, El Nino around 2004-05. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Parker and talk about stratification. Down is forward. Okay, down is forward. <laughs> Thanks very much. So I'll be speaking about one aspect of uh, changes in water quality, water, <coughs> excuse me, water properties, which, is, uh, which has to do with surface stratification. By stratification, I mean the change of density of the water as you go to greater depths. And of course, it's denser and uh, deeper. And that has a great deal to do with um, controlling the, uh, or it can be correlated with biological productivity because it tends to uh, isolate surface waters and deep waters and promote sometimes cytoplankton growth. 
I've been looking at the stratification of properties over a rather long historical record comparable to what Nate showed at four sites in Puget Sound, as shown on the map, one out in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, one at Admiralty Inlet, one uh, in the main basin at Point Jefferson, and one down in South Kitchenau at um, Minch Cove. The time extent of these records is shown here. Now, these are from CPD casts taken by a large variety of different organizations. The oldest ones come from Eugene Colius, who uh, compiled a lot of historical data. And um, most of what exists after that comes from the uh, State Department of Ecology records, especially in the uh, 90s and 2000s. In each of these plots, there's one plot for one of each of those four locations and then the x-axis is the year, so going back to almost 1935 in the case of Point Jefferson, y-axis in this case is salinity and showing top and bottom values, top is red, bottom is blue. This is largely just to show you that there's a long historical record but it's very gappy. The reason for um, looking at this particular property is that we don't have chlorophyll records back into the 30s, but we do have CTD casts. And so they're a, a proxy, so it's a, an example of looking where the light is brightest. Here, uh, combining all the years into their annual cycles. Uh, in, uh, um, so now the uh, x axis is this year day, and this is all the data for, uh, in this case, surface temperature. So red is surface waters, and blue is deep waters. And you see there's a, a distinct annual cycle in each of these places, fairly consistent year to year, some variability with a much bigger variation and much stronger stratification in the Ridge Cove than as it can now. And finally, looking at the stratification in each of those places, so cast by cast, you can compare what's the change of density over the um, top 10 meters, and now it's shown in the, uh, the bar plot at the bottom. Each of those locations shows the uh, annual average stratification, very weak in Strait of Juan de Fuca, very strong in Lynch Cove and Hood Canal. But the red and the blue now are dividing that data up into the, all the casts before 1980, and the red is all the casts after 1980. And the suggestion from at least this preliminary analysis of the data is that there's a noticeable increase of stratification of the surface waters in Puget Sound, rather small in some places, but, you know, this in, in Point Jefferson, main basin, that's like a doubling of near surface stratification. And to tell us about biogeochemical implications of stratification, my colleague, Jan Newton. Yeah. Okay. All right, so focusing the back now on, on biology, I wanted to start with a very simple schematic to the needs of a, of a phytoplankton cell. And so um, obviously sunlight, which typically comes from the surface, and, and nutrients, which typically come from underneath the water. And so thinking in the concept of this cell, now putting this back in the marine environment, we can have water columns that are either stratified or well mixed. And so. Um, I know that this is very basic here, but I just want us really getting to the point of the stratification and how this is important for the for the um, phytoplankton spring bloom. Um, in the in the beginning of spring, nutrients aren't limiting. So what's really important is that there's enough light and enough capability to stay in the portion of the water column where there is enough light. So. So that's why over here you have more phytoplankton cells because over here where it's mixed, they've got an equal probability of being above in the euphotic zone or washed down to below the euphotic zone. So the whole onset of the spring bloom happens when you have enough stratification and enough sunlight so that the population finds that, that balance in um, the, the, the lit waters without having too much of their population washed away. All right, so now thinking about stratification. Now here is something that's not so simple, but let me walk you through it. So there's three plots on here. The, the first one is the blunt bicola frequency, which is a measure of stratification. So the higher the number here, the more stratification. The lower the number, the more strongly it's mixed. This is a depth profile. Um, this is pressure, same thing. 
um, of chlorophyll from some propylene buoys in Puget Sound. And we're looking in February here. This is actually one in, in Hood Canal where the spring bloom comes very early. And so that the red colors are high chlorophyll. And then this is, is solar radiation here for the same time period that, that we're showing the chlorophyll. So more sun um, upwards, um, cloudier um, at the bottom of the axis. All right, so what I think is really interesting here is you've got three different years, 2005, 2006, 2007, and um, you see very different bloom dynamics. One with a bloom that starts sort of in the middle of February, one where it starts very early, and one where we have some hints that there was some chlorophyll accumulation but really no bloom during that same time period. So strong interannual variation, but if you look at the data, um, in terms of the stratification, the mixing, and the solar radiation, you need to have both. And so it's that, that you know, I, I can't do it with just one. I've got to have both in order to prosper. So, so here you see that, that there's some, some stability, but there's not as much sunlight. Then you get the sunlight, and the, the stability goes away. But then you get kind of just that Goldilocks um, combination, and that's where you start to get your bloom. Here you've got strong. Um, stratification and some pretty decent solar radiation. And those lines are just to help you see continuity. There's no thresholds implied there. And then in the last one, you've got nice strong stratification, but, but really wimpy thin. So, so you don't have that, that bloom. So, um, just the point of this slide is that we have some very strong interannual variation in the spring bloom, but <coughs> stratification is an important element of that, as well as the, um, um, sunlight. So, when I was working for the Department of Ecology, um, we started seeing in this long time series that they have that's now run um, by Christopher Krenz here in our audience, um, that during this one period, stratification became less. And what was going on was a drought. The 2000-2001 drought was a very major event. Here's the Fraser River, um, the Skagit, um, Snohomish and the Nacelle um, out in Willapa Bay. But you can see the drought period is this gray area here, just showing that it, this was a major, what they called, you know, a, a big, like a hundred year drought kind of um, event. And over here, what I did is I took the, the change in signature, the change in seawater density from the min to the max for that drought year, subtracted off the the 10 year um, average and expressed it as, a, as an anomaly, therefore, um, times a, um, a percentage. And you can see that, that we have this really striking pattern in Puget Sound of the percent reduction in stratification, presumably from this, this drought event. So, my point in, in putting this, this slide, um, which was published in the Canadian Water um, Resources Journal, um, is to say that, that the stratification is really sensitive not only to external boundary salinities and upwelling um, and temperature, but also to the freshwater input. And I was surprised at how much of an um, impact there was. The other thing is we measured um, up here at the gem stations, we measured the um, geostrophic exchange velocity and found a fourfold reduction in that exchange velocity. Um, so these are, these are really strong um, um, impacts on the water um, um, characteristics from, from these climate signals. So lastly, I just wanted to um, show you um, a different news. Um, this one is an acronym. The Northwest Association of Network Ocean Observing Systems is funded by NOAA, um, and this is the United States effort to pull together our ocean observing systems. We're going to hear about Venus, and we saw some beautiful data this morning from Richard. Um, this is um, the United States effort, and so each of these little icons is something you can click on, and when you do, the um, real-time data is available, and it's available for download. We also have a sea glider off here, off of La Push, and I wanted to mention that because we worked with Post. Got some Post was alive to put a Gumco um, um, receiver on that and, and to utilize that. So there are um, observing assets, and, and all of these dots are various entities. So this represents ecologies monitoring, um, the universities, Washington, tribes, NGOs, um, etc. So. So it's a, it's a collection, and that collection has recently published this um, composite of the Puget Sound Marine Water Conditions during 2011. 
And so, um, so I encourage you to check that out. All right. So um, with my remaining one minute, <laughs> um, here are the research recommendations from this panel. And um, so the first is to conduct retrospective analyses of density stratification, you know, and Parker's really made a good inroad on that, but looking at stratification, um, people are interested in the orca buoy records to, to look at, at um, chlorophyll and the relationship between chlorophyll and stratification in different areas and to maybe use that as a proxy for primary production. I think we could also think about how to model primary phytoplankton excuse me, phytoplankton production um, rates using things like the variables, chlorophyll, sunlight, um, um, temperature, and other means that, that have been published in the literature, um, adding sensors for PAR, and then developing a zooplankton and fish, forage fish monitoring program that can be implemented and sustained over multiple years. And lastly, to develop empirically based models for understanding and predicting the spring phytoplankton bloom um, that can be used to both contrast and forecast spring bloom dates. So I think this all comes to the mis mismatch concept of how it's so important to understand if that's our fundamental weak link for what's changing conditions and what role stratification has in that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you who will tell us about how food supply limits growth and the survival during critical periods of early marine rearing. Thank you. So um, when we try and look at, we think of what factors are affecting growth, uh, we go through the usual suspects, and of course food supply has emerged as a uh, concern uh, multiple times this morning. Uh, as you probably learned, we don't have uh, very good records to date to really measure directly what that food supply is for salmon. So we can use a surrogate by looking at what the, the feeding rate of salmon has been uh, and use that as a way to, uh, to substitute for uh, what the actual food supply might have been that was available to them while they were feeding. Also, energetic quality of food in terms of the energetic content of the prey. There's also other elements like vitamins and uh, essential fatty acids that can come into play as well. So we'll, we'll look briefly at that. And of course, temperature. What are the direct metabolic effects of temperature uh, in the face of, of trends in, in climatic variation? And then, if we do have, if there is food limitation, then is it a product of just the production of food, or is it competition either within or among species in various locations there? And I just did mention the seasonal production cycles of prey. And then uh, one thing we won't talk about too much is that you could have food available, but if there are other constraints to access to that food, such as environmental stressors or predation risk, et cetera, that could also come in and complicate the question quite a bit more. Okay, so the first question is growth limited by food supply. Uh, as I mentioned before, we don't have direct measures of zooplankton availability. So we're going to use these feeding rates, and we can do this by using uh, energetics models that match growth uh, of fish over a particular time interval. Uh, if you account for their, their diet, their change in thermal experience, uh, the quality of the food, et cetera, to try and uh, ask the question how much food had to be consumed in order to supply the, the growth that was observed over that period. And here are a couple of examples from uh, Puget Sound. These, again, are going back to those covered wire tag fish that I showed earlier on uh, for, for Chinook. And we've got uh, different regions within Puget Sound in 2001 and 2002. 2002 is a relatively low survival year uh, for juvenile Chinook, and 2001 was a high survival year. These are growth uh, between, for specific uh, covered wire tag groups in different regions of Puget Sound, and you can see that in 2001 we had much higher growth uh, for those fish than was present in 2002. Also, uh, pay attention to this here. This is the period over which the, the fish were available out in open water areas feeding on that pelagic food supply. So we can... Oops, that's wrong one. So in the high... In the high survival year, um, the fish gain three to five and three to four times the body mass that they have from the near shore uh, peak existing to their offshore peak, whereas they only they only doubled their 
weight uh, in the years where they, they had the lower survival rate. And then if we look at uh, the actual consumption dynamics of these fish, if we look uh, again in 2001, uh, the fish were feeding at between 66 and 90 percent of their maximum feeding rate in comparison to the year where they didn't grow as well, they were feeding at only 55 to 64 percent of their maximum growing weight. And the other important thing is, so they were feeding on average at least 20 percent higher uh, feeding rate than they, in the good survival year. And the other key component is that the majority of that variability could be tied back to the the, concentrate, the contribution of crab larvae, first of all, in the terrestrial insects we just mentioned right before lunch, uh, secondarily as being the, the two primary sources of food that, that really altered the variability, availability of food, the feeding rate, and uh, the growth and survival of these fish during that critical period. Okay, so along with that, you, you asked the question of, well, there may be food available, what's the quality, and does that really play into the growth dynamics very well? Uh, knowing that if you have only low energy types of food available, it's going to take a lot more of that food in order to, to attain the same growth rate. Um, you, can, you can measure uh, energy density of food fairly easily just by doing bomb calorimetry or approximate analysis there. Um, that's the information I'm going to show you today, but there are also alternative methods that uh, we can start looking at, at the different constituents in the diet that, that may play a role as well. For instance, the essential fatty acids, these fish can't necessarily fabricate uh, the fatty acids they need, so they are reliant on that from their prey in many instances. In the Great Lakes, for instance, there's a vitamin de deficiency, niacin, that was implicated as a source of mortality for Chinook sand there at one point. And then uh, um, in the future, tomorrow, Sandy will talk a bit about container uptake and, and its, its role in the food web here as well. Okay, so if we look at the composite energy density in the diet uh, from different years, so this, is, this would be the July diet of these, of these fish. What I'm showing is the energy density per gram of, of, of diet. And then within these stack bars, the different colors are representing the constituent contribution of each of these trait types. So it, it, it uh, integrates both the information in terms of the proportion of those prey in the diet and their energy density. So we multiply those two things together to come up with uh, the overall energy density the diet is during those periods. And then we can overlay on top of that uh, which years were uh, associated with high survival and growth versus low survival and growth. And I just want to point out that the, the year I just showed you, the low survival and growth, didn't necessarily, uh, wasn't associated at all with a low prey quality. So in, essentially, the quantity of prey during this period of their life is trumping the, the quality of the prey. So uh, higher feeding rate on a slightly lower uh, energy content food supply, in this case, is trumping things, and it, and it leads to higher growth and survival. The other thing we can look at is the direct metabolic costs on fish here. And what I'm showing are a family of curves that look at across the range of temperatures uh, that that are available that fish can survive in. If they have unlimited food supply, uh, a fish of a given size and a particular energy density of the site can grow at this rate. If you reduce that that feeding rate by 25 percent, they're going to drop the the growth curve, et cetera on down to 50%, and then this is zero growth here, so below this point, these fish are losing weight. Okay. And so what we can do then is overlay the thermal conditions that are uh, available in Puget Sound during the period that these juvenile salmon, in this case again, Chinook, are, are using, and then we can, we can plot what the sensitivity, sensitivity of those fish would be to growth uh, under an unlimited food supply across that range of temperatures. And similarly, if you had a reduced food supply as well, okay? Then we can also overlay the range of feeding rates that I showed you in a previous slide here. And what you can see is that uh, the range in feeding rates uh, is much greater, and so the sensitivity to growth overall is more a product of the feeding rate and this the prey availability rather than direct metabolic effects of temperature on these fish. Uh, one other question here. Or, if we look at the state of Georgia, they average about two degrees warmer than what we see in Puget Sound. And so although 
the salmon in Puget Sound are probably less susceptible to temperature change. Uh, those fish in the state of Georgia are now on the descending limb of most of these curves and so can be considerably more sensitive uh, to those those changes in temperature. So an incremental increase in temperature has a lot more implications for fish in Strait of Georgia than they would in Puget Sound, at least under current conditions. That's always the caveat you'll, you'll hear repeated repeatedly um, today. And so competition, you know, we often overlook the caveat that you need to have limited resources as the prerequisite for competition to be an issue. I think we've already shown that, that there is some uh, food limitation growth limitation, so uh, we can move on and look at some of these other potential aspects. So for potential competitors, they need to overlap in time and space. They need to have some diet overlap as well. And then we can also look at the relative consumption demand by different populations to get a sense for who's, who's taking the most of these shared resources in time and space. And again, we have just opportunistic data, but we can use that as a, as a, uh, a way to direct our future thoughts. So spatial and temporal overlap and relative abundance. This is some information from uh, midwater falling off the river in July 2004. And what we see is that most of these fish are in the epipelagic zone, the top 15 meters of the water column. The majority of these fish are herring. This next box here are non-Chinook salmon. This is a pink salmon year, so you've got pink salmon uh, representing about 30% of this block here. And then we have uh, Chinook salmon in this, in this point here. So if they're overlapping in time and space, in terms of relative abundance, the, the uh, herring are more abundant than these other fish. Okay. In terms of diet overlap, uh, I've got a couple of years here we can show that. Uh, considerable diet overlap between herring and Chinook in a, in a couple of different years that I'm showing. And again, these red uh, bars are the crab larvae portion of the diet. So things vary, but the overall picture uh, tells a similar story. Uh, if we look across all the juvenile salmon and herring, uh, so they're listed on the bottom of this graph here. What we're showing are just those prey that are, are uh, shared prey resources. So those bars that are lowest have the lowest overlap overall, and you'll see again, uh, as in Strait of Georgia, the Chum and Puget Sound uh, have the lowest overlap uh, with these other species, whereas Coho, Chinook, and Herring tend to overlap quite a bit, and Pink, yes, in some years, not so much in other years there. So now if we look at the relative consumption demand of, of fish at the population level, I'm just going to take the two extremes here. Uh, what we looked at were from Admiralty Inlet South to South Puget Sound, that composite of herring and uh, juvenile Chinook salmon. And these would just be the sub and Chinook salmon or ocean type. Um, the black bars represent the biomass of of consumption of these shared prey by herring, whereas the little gray piece on top is the component that was taken by the Chinook population. And the short version of the story is that uh, of those shared prey resources, herring are taking anywhere from 10 to 40 times the biomass of those important prey than the Chinook salmon are. So when we talk about uh, competition, uh, and I would suggest now, granted, this is a pooled look at, at Puget Sound as a whole, we're not looking at specific regions, so that story might change if you look at uh, more fine temporal spatial resolution. But this broad picture look suggests that uh, herring are having a lot more influence overall than say Chinook would have, have with each other, or that composite uh, assemblage of juvenile salmon overall might have on each other compared to the herring resource. So the overall picture, uh, I'm just simply suggesting that we need to pay attention to the community-wide uh, consideration of, of what these, these different consumers may have on the resource overall. Okay, and then uh, I was going to shift over to Julie for the bottom up stuff, but maybe you can just correct me if I go astray here, Julie. So, um, what's that? Okay, well, we'll rush through it. Um, State of Georgia is a, a food web model that was, was put together to look at uh, indicators of, of early marine survival by coho. And the top three, um, top three candidates that, that emerged were copepod biomass, zooplankton biomass anomaly overall, and herring biomass there. And I'm just going to 
go through these quick. If you have questions, you can ask Julie or, or maybe the perpetrators of those. And then uh, maybe stealing some of Bill's thunder from tomorrow. Uh, out on, on coastal Oregon here, again, coho salmon. Uh, if you look at uh, either small to adult survival of coho in the upper bars or adult returns in the lower bars, you see that you've got higher higher survival, higher adult returns. When you have the lipid-rich northern species of copepods available versus the warm water southern species that, that are there. And then I'll just segue to um, some of the proposed activities. Again, the idea of merging these, uh, the prey supply information with uh, times and spaces that are relevant to feeding and growth of the juvenile salmon. So monitor zooplankton uh, and the, the prey, prey fish abundances at the appropriate time scale, so those critical growing seasons from, say, April through September. Um, the sample design needs to um, pay attention to depth. As I indicated, we've got fish that are in the epipelagic zone, so depth stratified sampling is going to be important. Uh, to do it frequently enough so that we can capture the, the dynamics of those populations overall. And then the idea is to try and estimate the density and biomass of these key prey through time uh, to get that work done. And then we can meld that with the information we collect directly from the consumers, so what's the diet, the size, growth, and, and distribution patterns of juvenile salmon and forage fish, and uh, do that specifically through these routine monitoring programs. And also it would be very useful since we know not very much about the uh, the true quantification of the epipelagic community is used on acoustic hydroacoustic sampling during this critical period in March uh, to really get a quantitative assessment of biomass and, and numerical density there. And then um, try to get some of the mechanistic issues that we talked about earlier. So getting back at what's the dietary quality of prey. Uh, again, lipids, fatty acids, the energy density overall. Uh, again, this temporal facial cameras can be very important to, to uh, keep that as an organizing principle. And then we need to look at whether or not these, these uh, processes are, are occurring smoothly throughout the regions or whether we do have these biological hotspots. Again, when you look at the physical oceanography, you have very discrete areas where there's very high mixing and, and where some of that action is occurring uh, both within and in the, at the edges of those zones. And then, again, uh, looking at the different vertical layers is going to be important to uh, to try and organize our sampling. Okay. All right. Next, we will hear from Ken Dennis, who will tell us about ocean acidification in the context of the Salish stream. And I know this is the after lunch session, so feel free to stand up. We're in wild different kinds of things. I think we will get a copy of the opinion. I thought you were going to say, feel free to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that one. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Number four. So, I'm giving kind of a geochemical context of ocean acidification uh, before I hand it off to Paul McElhaney, who's going to talk about the effects, the likely effects on fish. And so, why are the oceans acidifying? About 30% of the uh, carbon dioxide we have released through fossil fuel emissions has ended up in the ocean. Sorry. And when, and when the carbon dioxide enters the ocean, it immediately, like within a minute, goes through two dissociation reactions and it forms carbonic acid. So, that reduces the pH of the ocean. Oops, wrong one. Okay. Yeah, the bottom line. Line. The bottom line. Oh. Okay. So, uh, what what does the future tell us? Well, this is uh, fossil fuel emissions uh, put together by the Global uh, Carbon Project, and I actually used their two-year-old. They, they'll have another update coming out in December, but I used their two-year-old um, picture and then added updates because. This is the last time these hollow uh, circles, they make projections into the future. So these, these black dots are the rate of fossil fuel emissions per year in uh, petagrams of carbon. And in the 90s, they increased about 1% per year up till the 2008 crash, 3.2%. 
They then jumped up almost 6% in 2010 and in 2011, another 2%. So uh, these, these lines, the shaded area is 40 uh, scenarios that we developed uh, for how human society might uh, change over the next uh, century. And uh, for the most part, none of the modeling groups ever bothered with these A1 FI. FI stands for fossil fuel intensive because they never expected countries with that. That was just the upper limit of our imagination. And as you can see, we're following the, the median of those A1 FI um, uh, scenarios. So the projection is it's going to get worse before it gets better in terms of, of the ocean acidification. This is, uh, I'm going to go from open ocean down to our own area. This is this is Hawaii, and so this is the uh, famous uh, uh, partial pressure carbon dioxide measurements by Dave Keening on uh, Mauna Loa, so it's about 10,000 uh, feet elevation. And then a group uh, led by Dave Carl at the University of um, Hawaii for the last 25 years have been going twice a month by ship out to Station Aloha. And you can see that the PCO2 in the surface ocean is tracking that in the atmosphere, and the pH is uh, dropping for the last two decades. And this is not resolving all the variability because they only go out twice, uh, twice a month, but, but there is an annual cycle associated with the annual production cycle. So this is uh, from our risk system model, and this is what used to be called the business as usual um, kind of scenario. And and what what we've plotted here is the the saturation level of, of for aragonite. Aragonite is the form of calcium carbonate that you find in coral. And so this is uh, 2000, and this is uh, 2050, and our model is projecting that these uh, corrosive waters that, that uh, we're going to dissolve that form of calcium carbonate will reach all the way down our coastline. So, so, and I must say that we, what we really need to do is do some more high resolution modeling because this is the salmon when they uh, head off into the Pacific by a century from now will be will be uh, in pretty extensive water. This is uh, a recent paper by Gretchen Hoffman at the University of Santa Barbara. This is open ocean pH. This is 30 days on the same scale. That's open ocean. Uh, this is, uh, these are samples uh, over coral reefs, so highly or diurnally driven by the sun and the, the production cycle. And then you see here pH in upwelling areas off California. There's very large variation associated with with upwelling, and then when you look in estuarine uh, areas where you've got fresh water and salt water uh, passing by your area tidally, you see you also have large variation. So we have these kind of waters are coming in, as uh, Richard Dewey showed, coming in and mixing up into our inlet, and then there are areas in, uh, in the sailor Sea where we have this kind of effect as well. So the good news is that our, our fish have already been exposed to high variability. The bad news is that this is going to be superimposed on a trend of reducing pH. This is uh, from Vic Feely. This shows the corrosive waters uh, coming near the surface. This is all done in, in a, a long cruise in 2007. And uh, in his supplement to this paper, he estimates that the, the same levels of, of, um, of corrosive waters now come up 50 meters higher onto the shelf than they used to uh, in pre-industrial times. And so this water is from the California undercurrent. It also has low oxygen. And this shows uh, the rate of oxygen loss in uh, micromoles per kilogram per year. And this is uh, Haida Gwaii, this is West Coast of Vancouver, and this is Southern California. So at the area of the outer edge of the shelf, for around 200 to 250 meters over the last few decades, the, the, the dissolved oxygen has been decreasing. So we have, we have warmer water decreasing um, 
pH or, or waters are becoming more corrosive and decreasing oxygen. There's multiple stresses are going to be affecting our fish and the food webs that support them. And this is just uh, to show how some of this is advected in, but then you bring this water in and it goes through all these passages and it ends up in the upper end of the hood canal. And there's a runoff and things that give a lot of nutrients and so you get a lot of primary production, you get a lot of organic matter sinking into the sulfur sediment traps that they were there. You create large biological oxygen demand. And this uh, respiration equation, you take these organic molecules, you take oxygen out of the water, you put carbon dioxide in the water so, it, so you've got this local mechanism that drives the pH even lower and increases the, uh, and drives the oxygen lower at the same time. And so the regional issues is that a global concern is usually surface pH, but in up in regions, we have this upwell of low pH in subsurface waters, which we also have to consider because it's coming in and then mixing up to the water column in the Admiralty Inlet and off Victoria. And then these upwelling events cause this large range and variability in pH together with the tidally water related fresh water effects. It also brings low oxygen as well, so we have these multiple stressors that we will have to consider together. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have uh, Paul Magdalene, who will talk about increased carbon dioxide concentrations in directly affecting salmon survival, or perhaps increasing our susceptibility to other sources of mortality in the state of sea. And I just got an update from Mike. We are sensing that we might need a break um, in the session, so what we'd like to do is after Paul speaks, we will take our break. We'll move that up a little bit. Okay, so there's a little pressure now because I'm between you and a break. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to go fast. Um, so uh, Ken uh, talked about the sort of oceanography of uh, ocean precipitation in the region. I'm going to focus on biological effects and uh, in particular on salmon. Uh, if I can make the slides go forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see how Okay. Um, so I'll start with what we know very well, and we just saw this slide. Um, so I don't need to go into over in, in detail, but we know um, that the Atmospheric CO2 is increasing, the ocean CO2 is increasing, the oceans are acidifying, and because we know this uh, equation very well, we know that as a consequence, the carbonate uh, ion concentration in the ocean is decreasing. This is important biologically because uh, organisms that make calcium carbonate shells and structures, uh, they have difficulty or it's impossible for them to do that if the carbonate ion concentration gets too low. Uh, but it's not just an issue for calcifiers because these other, okay, I'm going to try the laser works. Okay, all right. Uh, these other, uh, the pH change itself and the PO2 concentration can have quite physiological effects on non-calcifiers as well. So we know that very well. Uh, what we know with this is that these chemical changes do have changes, uh, do affect organisms. And we have this from lab experiments. This is an example from the study in our lab looking at pteropods that were collected in Puget Sound and exposed to different uh, CO2 concentrations. But these CO2 concentrations range from 400, which is about atmospheric uh, CO2 concentrations right now, up to 3,200, which is maybe twice the uh, end of century projections um, for kind of worst case scenarios. But uh, as we just heard, the CO2 concentrations here in it's kind of the same as sea are naturally higher than atmospheric conditions because of these upwelling events. And so we have to take that into consideration when we're interpreting these experiments um, and uh, thinking about what we'll see in the future. Okay. So we know, uh, what we don't know as well is how uh, the results from these individual uh, experiments done on individual species in laboratory conditions will translate into changes uh, in entire ecosystems and communities in the real world. Uh, but we have some uh, evidence to suggest that there could be pretty profound uh, changes to ecosystems as a result of this sophistication. Uh, one uh, line of evidence is from the paleo record. So if we look back about uh, 5,500 uh, million years ago, which is kind of how far we have to go back to find any sort of analogous sort of situation, where we have a, a large increase uh, of CO2 in a short amount of time, 
Uh, this is a pretty rapid by geologic standards, but it's still the current rate of increase in CO2 is 10 to 100 times faster than it occurred during this period. Uh, but during this period, we see this huge decrease in the calcium carbonate production from the marine system, um, and that's uh, associated with big changes in the uh, biota uh, during that during that period. Another line of evidence for ecosystem shift is a contemporary look at natural CO2 dents. Uh, this is an example from New Guinea of a coral reef, uh, and you can see a big difference in the community uh, complexity and, and structure uh, from the control sites as to as you move closer to the, to the uh, CO2 vent itself. Um, so uh, a third of what we've seen this morning are efforts to try and correlate recent changes uh, and time series of salmon survival and abundance uh, to environmental parameters. We don't have those kind of data for any organism anywhere uh, for ocean acidification uh, at the moment, where we can definitively uh, correlate. Oops, ah, can I go back? Um, where I can correlate uh, a, a change in abundance uh, in a recent time series with anthropogenic uh, CO2 through acidification. Uh, climate change is kind of a different story, but through acidification. Probably the closest case that we have is here on the west coast, uh, and that's with uh, Pacific oysters. Uh, the top uh, uh, figure is from off of the Oregon coast, and this is uh, pH and aragonite saturation state uh, from, for uh, intake as a hatchery on the Oregon coast. And the bottom figure shows the survival of larvae that are grown in um, in these different intake waters. Uh, and you can see that under the low saturation state, low pH waters, uh, they have a low survival of these marine, of these uh, oyster larvae. Uh, and there's been a, a high frequency of this low pH water uh, over the last several years, which has led to a, a crisis in the oyster uh, production on the West Coast. So moving from Let's kind of general effects to uh, try to look uh, at what we can see in salmon. I'm not aware of any uh, experiments directly looking at ocean acidification effects on salmon, uh, but we can uh, look at what we see in other fish. One effect that we see is a uh, change in otolith size. The otolith is the only calcium carbonate structure in the fish. Um, and uh, they see an increased size with increased CO2 concentration. It's not clear if this has any uh, sort of fitness effect at all, but it, it is an observable change. Uh, another simple direct effect on the fish themselves are changes in behavior and neurophysiology. Uh, this is an example uh, from some great work by Phil uh, Mundy in his lab in Australia looking at uh, reef fish exposed for a couple of days to high CO2 uh, they can lose the uh, ability uh, to, to uh, distinguish all factory cues between predators and prey. They learn, um, they lose, uh, they behave uh, more riskier and that they spend more time out in the open. Uh, and they mechanistically trace this to a change in a, a neuroreceptor. Another direct uh, effect uh, on fish that's been observed are changes in larval development. Uh, so these are the, the neighbors over side decrease. Uh, larval survival uh, grown in, under a uh, higher CO2. Uh, salmon uh, do their freshwater larval development uh, in freshwater. Uh, so it's, it, it'll, it'll be a little different story, but uh, there's uh, some interesting things with multiplication um, that may be uh, worth exploring. So that's uh, looking at direct effects. Even if there aren't any direct effects on the fish themselves, but there may be indirect effects through uh, very effective events. One is through prey availability or quality. Uh, as an example, uh, this is an experiment done with krill of uh, the top. Yeah. The top figure is a, a, a Antarctic krill, and you see uh, irregular and uh, lethal uh, development of, of krill inside the egg um, under high CO2. Uh, we're doing some experiments looking at krill and copepod uh, and uh, with crab, uh, crab larvae. Uh, um, a project that was uh, by Jason Miller. Um, and here, I wanted to show some uh, preliminary data from those experiments. Uh, it's, it's really fresh. Julie just sent this to me last night. So, um, uh, and this is looking at uh, copepod uh, larvae, and we've, we've seen a, a decrease in um, hatching success 
uh, with the higher CO2 treatment. Uh, we're still uh, kind of working on these data and uh, doing more experiments. Another patient with direct, indirect effect is, uh, effect on fish is through habitat. Uh, so some studies have shown increased growth in eel grass through uh, simulation of photosynthesis. Uh, under elevated CO2, um, to the extent that uh, fish larvae use eel grass and the eel grass extends, uh, not all of the uh, impacts of participation might be negative, but it's a, it'll be a complicated story to, to sort out. Uh, Pinero sigma um, also show an increase in growth under high CO2, particularly under elevated uh, temperatures. And since uh, they can be a lethal to salmon, that's an important potential indirect effect. And, um, and there's a final example of indirect effects, uh, toxics. Uh, these are uh, experiments looking at uh, toxics in the metals in the sediments, uh, shown increased uh, lethality uh, in um, high CO2 conditions. So taking all of these uh, kind of individual experiments uh, and looking at ecosystem effects, uh, we've um, uh, used an ecopath model of uh, Puget Sound uh, and looked at what happens if we change the productivity of the calcifying groups that are circled there in, in black. We uh, looked at how many of the organisms in Puget Sound uh, make calcium carbonates, about 30% or 600 species or so. And uh, this is looking at some results from that um, analysis. Uh, on, in, in terms of response of harvested fish after 50 years of, of uh, simulation, uh, with either 5, 15, or 25 percent decrease in the productivity of all of those calcifying groups. Um, some ways it's kind of interesting that it's not, uh, as much, that there's not sort of even more change. Particularly if you look at the salmon, uh, there's just less than a 5 percent change indicated by this model, which is um, kind of within the noise of the model. Um, and, but I, I would take this, uh, um, we kind of interpret this model as uh, illustrating some of the potential of, uh, indirect and non-intuitive effects that you might see, like, uh, you know, some species increasing, uh, some species not changing, even though they have some uh, direct negative effects, uh, like the urchins, because of uh, the, sort of the food web dynamics changes between competitors uh, and different prey uh, types in the model. Uh, so I, this is by no means a, a final answer. There are lots of things that are not in the model and lots of uh, things that are poorly parameterized. Uh, but it is a start. Uh, so uh, I'll just kind of wrap up with a couple of things here from the uh, from the report. Uh, we have some hypotheses related to, to prey, direct effects on salmon themselves, a hair of sigma, and then multiple stressors. As Ken just pointed out, you're going to get this combination of low oxygen and warming, toxic, sort of the whole mix. Uh, and some recommendations for research. I just want to highlight here uh, that we also uh, recommend uh, considering the uh, Washington Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Sophistication. They are coming out with a report at the end of this month where they, uh, a, a group of great people, have spent a lot of time thinking about these different uh, science recommendations uh, for ocean sophistication. Uh, management implications, this is a hard one uh, to address, but uh, I, mean, I think the one with the, sort of the most uh, potential is uh, reducing other stressors options. And then finally, so uh, salmon is probably not a primary factor in these recent survival patterns for a number of reasons that we can get into uh, later. Uh, but it is likely to have an impact as uh, ecosystems respond to Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Um, okay, so I promised you a break. Let's take 15 minutes. This is about 2.15, 3 by 9 watch. So 2.55. Thank you. Friends, okay. so we're going to take about 15 minutes. Is on a, a hypothesis that harmful algae directly affects salmon survival through acute or chronic mortality and may adversely affect prey availability by food webs and farmers in the state of state. Thank you. So I'm going to start off by giving you a primer on header sigma and um, a one minute primer. I'll talk a little bit about some of the other harmful algae in the area for well, probably 10 seconds. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to conclude with some general comments and, and some research needs. Hitter sigma is a rosettophyte that's a golden brown microalgae. It occurs worldwide and it's most prevalent in temperate areas like 
to the science period of your uh, and and the subtropical seas. It kills farm and or wild fish in the Salish Sea in Delaware, North Carolina, Texas, and many locations in both east and western hemispheres. And it's considered by some authorities to be the most allelopathic harmful algal bloom species uh, known to man. Not necessarily the most toxic, but, but the most harmful to the food web. Um, cysts germinate from the benthos. They, and they, they swim up and they may form massive unilateral blooms um, that cover entire basins or more. And when I say unilateral, you know, my observations are doing metros and so forth is that there's nothing else in the water, like the water column. So it's all heterosigma. And you don't see any uh, sports fish around either. So it, it can be a pretty impressive thing to happen. Um, and, and then, and then we, you don't really know in our area whether these uh, other organisms are extirpated or killed or both. It is vertically migration capable, up in the day for light or down at night for nutrients. It's, it's not always the case, and oftentimes there's nutrients at the surface. Um, it's variable as a variable range in, in swimming to uh, uh, 10 to 15 meters or more. New research just came out showing that it swims about twice as fast that it's being pursued by uh, zooplankton. It, it may be physically mixed to 40 meters or more in, in fish killing concentrations, and I measure that in North Puget Sound. The etiology or cause of fish loss is unknown. Uh, it's been theorized that the reactive oxygen species, such as hydrogen peroxide, or that there's a toxin in Japan, they think they found toxin, a very uh, lethal toxin, fish toxin. But um, there is some work going on right now in Puget Sound there that's trying to figure that right out. It is tolerant of all salinities, and however it grows fastest in brackish water. And it's complicated because of different strains, at least six in, in the Salish Sea. Uh, the blooms do occur in fair weather conditions with neat tides under warmer, vertically stratified water columns. And I, I like to say that uh, the farmers actually use a conceptual model to make their own predictions. So we can see out about a week usually we know when these are going to bloom and, and it's almost like clockwork. So the case study that uh, we published in 2010 was on the marine survival of Fraser River sockeye, and you already heard about choco stock, versus um, the, the heterosigma bloom index in May and June, the time of the outmigration of the stock, about six weeks. Uh, here we have the choco stock. Whoops. Here, here we have the laser button, and uh, we've got a decline overall, but within that, in years uh, where there was a major bloom, um, we see very poor returns. Um, let's go ahead. And, but overall, in the, the area in the entire, uh, this was the Strait of Georgia up to the north end of Vancouver Island, the South Strait of Georgia was really the hot area. 48% of all samples had some heterosigma. These are weekly samples. And this is from the Harmful Algal Bloom Monitoring Program in British Columbia. It's an independent organization that's paid for by the fish farmers. Forty percent of those uh, of the samples had bloom levels. As a result of this, or as a, 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 an amazing consequence uh, or coincidence, we saw about 2.7% survival of the two-year uh, salt fish coming back. And then down here we have the juvenile migration years. So you can see 2007, the day of that, and then in 2009, we had a tremendously poor return. In non-bloom years or minor bloom years, there was about 10.9% new survival of the choco stock with high correlations to this process. The data is not perfect. There's, we're missing the uh, 
fish data in one year, we have a mixture of a couple of years of algae data. So um, one other bit of data that's of interest is this relationship between herring and sockeye. And this is the same so-called data that Mike LaPointe uh, provided to us. And you can see here that we have a fairly tight correlation in the September young of the year herring abundance with the two-year survival rates of Choco, Fraser River, Sockeye, and also going to back to the prior slide, slide the Syria of Georgia had a sigma bloom time. Um, and the fact is that, that the Fraser River Sockeye salmon are swimming through the, the Strait of Georgia, South Strait of Georgia, and the, the, the entire area. Uh, and young of the year, herring only coiled her for about six weeks in this May June period. And this can be interpreted to mean that the sockeye salmon and marine survival rates are largely determined in that early period and coincide with the heterosigma blooms. And of course, that's not proof that heterosigma are killing the fish or injuring the food web, but it is a potential smoking gun. So one of the things that people should ask me, but if they don't, is well, where are the carcasses? We're going to do a forensic investigation, it's good to have bodies. Um, and and uh, so we thought, I thought about it, and first I say that dead salmon sink. And there were surface time, it's actually like the, our Canadian neighbors wonderfully have researched this. Uh, Patterson at all. Resurface time, at least in fresh water, was dependent on bacterial gas, gas production and temperature. But in the marine waters, where we have lots of predators uh, and, and lots of tides, uh, it's easy to spread these, these organisms out. So um, I thought I had 10 minutes, but I, yeah, okay. So um, I'll just go through these fast. Accenture, um, so we have seen wild dead fish, both green fish and sal salmonid mortalities in Puget Sound, usually in Cape Inlet down to South Puget Sound as recent as this last year. And we see, typically see dead wild fish around the fish farms in Washington State um, during major bloom events. Juvenile sockeye, of course, are surface oriented. Um, and we also know from fish farms providing us data that fish that do survive exposure have a, a, a poor growth phenomenon afterwards. And, there's, and these fish, as well as wild fish, could be susceptible to secondary disease infections, uh, parasitism, and predation by wild fish if they're, they're wild. It'd be a lot easier if we were in Florida. We know when there's a fish kill down there. So what's changed? Um, you've already seen this figure. I didn't know they were going to show it, but that's good. It's driving it home. Here's 93 and 97, which were two very big heterosigma bloom years and well documented by Pacific Biologic Biological Station staff and the NIMO and resulted in the forest returns in that whole decade two years later. Of, of, uh, 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 the Choco Saka. So we do have warmer springs, and I was able to, in the paper, tie this, these uh, blooms to also close correlation with earlier peaks of the Fraser River Saka. And um, all that began in 1989. 2007 was extremely anomalous year, of course. And now I'm just going to, since I only have a minute and a half, I'll move on to the other ones, starting with, or just, I'll uh, just pick Catoceros. This is um, Catoceros subgenus Theoceros. These are the large body, um, not garden variety, Catoceros. And you can see they have these big spines, and these, these tend to stick, and these are the FEMs I've taken of both the, the diatom and the gill tissue. They'll stick right in the gills and cause the, the, um, you know, the fish to produce mucus from molecular cells that emerge and, and vent the mucus causes blood, hypoxia, hypercapnia, lesions, and, and actually the secondary infections too. 
this organism, uh, these diatoms are occurring any time of year, more common in spring and fall during the juvenile and adult cell body fish migrations. And they do occur uh, throughout the water column, and they're usually not stratified, although that's been seen in uh, day about day. Um, we don't know anything about population for axon fish. So here's a close up. Here are these little sharp barbs that cause the are really sticking to be, to be uh, a major threat. So I'll, I won't, I don't have time to go through these, but there's a bunch of other heavy duty actors in the Stone, Cochlebenium, and so forth, uh, that are known heavy actors. We have, uh, also have other hot bottle species that we know probably produce toxins, we have no idea what those are. And we do have advanced methods available now uh, where we can now we can use molecular techniques such as the environmental sample processor was tried out this year in um, Friday Harbor and we found a fair number of heterosigmates surprisingly in a place like Channel on Channel where you wouldn't expect them uh, because of the, the vertical mixing that goes on there. Um, another real exciting tool that's just become that, that may be useful in this whole pursuit in the future is the flow cytobot. Not a very catchy name, but it is an autonomous, continuous phytoplankton species composition analysis instrument. These are being produced commercially now, and it splits out between video and flow cytometry, the large uh, and the small size fractions. And, and you have software, you train it for a local area, and it gives you months of, of unaided continuous streams of data of phytoplankton species composition. The, usually, excuse me, usually the, the, uh, the complaint about phytoplankton species composition data is it's too busy. Well, I'd like to get it and then reassemble it into major taxa with the harmful ones over here and the flagellates here and the microflagellates here. And then we can start talking, talking about something that's going to be very useful to predict. Um, so I wrote about uh, research needs, but uh, I'd rather just, just end by saying um, you can you can read this if you want. Uh, presently, there, there we have a little bit of infrastructure to warn people about these blooms and they're coming. We really don't have much in the way of uh, any systematic recording of species composition or even the, a good extent, spatial extent and temporal extent of where the blooms are occurring. It's mainly based on what the shellfish farmers give us and what the finfish farmers want to sell. So it's an open question. Does heterosigma affect some lines in the Salish Sea? Uh, does it affect, does, does this organism that's known as the most allelopathic harmful algal bloom species affect our food web? Thank you. Thanks, Jack. All right, Ken, Ken Nunes will talk about the Venus Network, observation, past, present, and future. I was inspired to be pissing or you can come a little bit pissed off. So, <laughs> Venus stands for Victoria Experimental Network Under the Sea, so we've, we've had a um, a cabled observatory in Santa Chinlock for over six years and in the Strait of George for about four years. Oops. And can I go back? And this is uh, the, the older but smaller sister of the uh, Venus, uh, Neptune Canada, which is off the west coast of Vancouver. This is just on the left that shows the uh, the number of vessels in each of these little squares in the year 2006 compiled by uh, the government of British Columbia, and this is to remind us that this is not a pristine environment. It has between six and seven million people living around the Sea, and there's a lot of moon traffic and other activities. So it's uh, we we may be the main uh, culprit here. We have we have uh, nodes where the cable that comes out maybe speeds about here. So a cable comes out uh, near the Vancouver Airport, 
and we had nodes at 300 meters and 170 meters, and then uh, a study by uh, Natural Resources Canada looking at something and uh, and the stability of the of the of the data here. In addition, uh, we were studying instrument BC ferries on the three there's a route across here, two or three routes, and we also have an observatory near IOS and San Chino. We saw this um, these from in Richard's talk, I just put them all, all on one uh, one timeline. And so up until this year, Venus was basically instruments on the bottom of the ocean, except for uh, upward-looking uh, acoustics devices. And the one most relevant here, this is from San Jose, this is the low point and acoustic profile. And you see this was, uh, oops. This was, uh, just a second, sorry. This was the last February, just before I went to the Ocean Sciences meeting. So these are 30 second averages, and what you see is you. Okay. So you see the good point in, uh, when the sun sets, they go up near the surface. This is reflected from the surface. And then uh, these are mainly the deposits, and they spend all night feeding. Uh, presumably on uh, smaller organisms, phytoplankton, and then as soon as the sun starts, it starts to get light, they go back down. In this case, it's at 96 meters, I think, and so they go right near the bottom. This is uh, one that I took uh, two weeks ago because I was giving a talk at Bedford Institute, and you can see much more structure. And also from that from the indication that they're only coming down partly through the water column, and uh, this time of year the water below about here is, is uh, very near zero oxygen. You can see it at, at the end of the summer we tend to go almost anoxic, so they're probably spending their daytime and the ones that don't migrate up, they probably sit just above the uh, low oxygen water. But anyway, we have. Uh, a number of years of, of this every 30 seconds. And so this, this is just looking at time. And you can see that in the winter, when the night's longer, they're up there longer. And then in the summer, they're only up there for a shorter time. And this shows the timeline that we've had this uh, here. And so this is a slice at 10 meters depth. And you can see they're up all night. And then in the summer, you also see uh, other organisms that, that don't migrate, probably uh, copepods and other species of snow plants and such. But the, the pinus volatiles, they go down um, and they only come up during uh, the night time to, to see. So we have a, a PhD student with John Dowler who's trying to analyze these, uh, these records. Anyway, we're in the process of instrumenting these uh, three BC ferry routes, and we've had this one instrumented from Good Point, just south of Nanaimo, to Sawasa. It's been instrumented for now since uh, June, and this is where the phrase of plume is. And the other thing I'm showing on this slide is we have uh, codar installations here, and here just near the Sawasa ferry. And so these are about a 45 minute average current. I've uh, taken uh, surface currents and with this codar, and you can see that that this was uh, 11 a.m. or 11, uh, universal time last week, and it's pretty well strong currents going to the north. And they're pushing up towards one meter a second. And then uh, three hours later, you see much more uh, pattern in, in here, partly driven by the flow from the Fraser, but this is this is when the tidal currents are probably fairly small. So, so any uh, fish that are migrating through this area, the small fish, they're definitely going to have to deal with these currents. Five, okay. And so the BC ferry. This is what uh, one day of the first of June looked like. Uh, this is the 
the Watson and this is a good point, so that takes about two hours to go across, two hours. And what you see here is the cortical fluorescence. And you can see that here's the Watson, there's, there's a bloom, and then it's not always in the same place, probably because of those current changes on the last slide. Uh, if you look at the tracks during that one day, you can see you can see that there's more of the chlorophyll down in this area and not much up here at all. But, but we have this now uh, every ferry trans. Well, actually, right now that ferry is in dry dock for two weeks. But but we when it's not in dry dock, we have this, and we're just uh, getting ready to start taking calibration samples for the the chlorophyll and some of the other things we're looking at. This is this is the month of June. This is temperature. So each of those that that shows that's nighttime, that white line, so that's the eight trips of the year, whatever, each day, and you can see that a surface temperature is increasing in general, but obviously there's water gradients across back and forth across the state of Georgia along the territory. Unfortunately, on the 1st of August, we had a major power failure, and we had a cruise on the pony about 10 days later to do all sorts of good things, but instead we had to re we retrieve everything um, using the rope hose here. And so these are those big nodes that we run our instruments out from. And uh, that's an upward looking Doppler current meter. There's a sediment trap there, for example. Anyway, uh, currently we should get a decision in a day or so about whether we're allowed to use a U.S. cable ship to, to do the repair or whether we have to use a Canadian ship that we don't think can do the job. So we're, this is now being determined in Ottawa by some kind of Canada free trade uh, panel. So once we have all that in the water and we're all set to put it all back, uh, then we'll be back to the, the type of data you saw before. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ken. All right. Next we'll hear from uh, Ian Curry. Who will give us an overview of the knowledge gaps arising from the GFO's trade in Georgia. So thank you very much. I've taken a, uh, a somewhat different approach to my presentation here. And I've taken the, uh, the approach that what we need to do, what we've been asked to do as panel members is to make us think broadly. And in particular, late in the afternoon, just before the discussion session, I want you to sit back, put your pens down, and just think. Because I'm only going to present to you um, words, and, and I'm going to put these into what I might call a Rumsfeldian context. <laughs> and so there are there are some things that, that we know, at least there are some things that we think we know. And the reason that I'm doing it this way is because I have the advantage or luxury perhaps of giving you a, a much longer talk tomorrow just before lunchtime about our Strader Georgia Ecosystem Research Initiative. So basically this slide is, is more or less taken from the conclusion of my talk tomorrow. But it's, it's some of the outcomes from our, our, our ERI program. And so uh, in that program and other studies, of course, it's not uh, exclusive, we're beginning to understand some of the anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic stressors in the strait and basically how the Strait of Georgia works. And here, when I say strait, I'm talking about, I'll call it the greater Strait of Georgia, in a spatial sense. Um, and there, we're understanding some of the needs that and where and what this might be in terms of comprehensive monitoring. We're making, I think, very good progress on some indicators, both of ecosystem health and specific indicators for marine management problems, stock uh, assessment problems, those sorts of things. We're understanding or beginning to understand something about thresholds in these indicators and ecosystem responses to pressures. We're making good progress on tools for ecosystem assessment, various types of ecosystem modeling. A little bit about some of the spatial management issues, uh, pelagic, benthic, and nearshore areas. And although we didn't do much about this uh, explicitly, a lot of our activities relate to data management. So that's all tomorrow. That's all kind of previews of coming attractions, if you like. But there are, of course, things that we know we don't know. And these are the things that came out of our ERI program, which were obvious knowledge and data gaps. So, sorry. 
So if I push the right button, there we go. Uh, so they include, of course, abiotic factors. And uh, so there are some listed here. These include interactions among the several processes which replace water masses in the stream. Basically, how are the water masses in the Strait of Georgia replaced? What controls the residence time? What um, basically then uh, controls how these water masses influence the conditions on the street? Some of the work that Ken uh, spoke about, some of the work that Richard Dewey spoke about, relate to processes driving replacement of water masses in the street. But there's a lot of things we don't know. In particular, as the water mass, the, the temperature and salinity of those water masses in the outer ocean change, that has a big influence on where they end up inside the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Strait of Georgia, Puget Sound area. The influence of winds and fresh water on the low frequency changes in the productivity of the marine food web. Uh, is uh, how this works specifically is that, uh, that question. And then in particular, something that relates to what Sophie talked about is the impact of uh, average versus short-term but intense events, such as annual winds versus storm winds. These strong events are hard to monitor, but they may change conditions in the street significantly, which if we're not out there monitoring, we may not actually recognize as what was driving those kinds of changes. There are, of course, biotic factors. This first one here is why we're all here today. Uh, there's, out of our work uh, in the Strait of Georgia, there's a lot of questions that have arisen as to what exactly the pinnipeds are feeding on. How much are they actually feeding on salmon versus other species? We've also found in just some very recent sampling that there's been significant changes in the trends of, of large, of, of midwater forage species in the Strait of Georgia, specifically the Pacific Hake and the walleye pollock. Pacific Hake seem to be going down, pollock seem to be coming up, and they seem to be segregating the strait. Hake have also are, are seem to be, or traditionally have been considered important prey species for the, the pinnipeds in the strait. And then something that Nate and uh, uh, Julie touched on earlier this afternoon is changes in the abundances of these large cold water lipid rich copepod species. They seem to have gone way down in abundance in the middle of the 2000s. They, they look like they're coming up a little bit now with the colder uh, water temperatures. But to what extent is, you know, what's controlling that and what's the impact on it? There are then other things, and uh, these I think are relevant for the discussion here today. We funded in our program not just one upper trophic level model, level model, but two. And something that we want to be quite cognizant of is all models are wrong. It's just some of them are more wrong than others. If you have one model, there's a tendency to believe it or not. If you have two models, and they're that far apart, you might believe neither of them. If you have two very different models, and they're this far apart, well, maybe there's something robust about the projections or predictions that these models are making. So be cautious of single model approaches. It's, and we need to move to expl a spatially explicit models. This is really clear from all the talks today. We know in, up in Canada, at least, we know very little about the nearshore and benthic dynamics and how they couple to the whole e functioning of the ecosystem. And then something that Brian Riddle and um, uh, Isabel Pearsall have addressed is that we're losing a lot of scientists, figuratively and literally, I suppose, uh, and in particular, the data and knowledge that they have, both in their, in their file cabinets and in their heads. And we need to capture that in some way. And of course, as you know, you all know what's coming next, the next slide, right, from so is there are things that we don't know we don't know. And this, of course, is where people make or break their career. These are the things that nobody saw coming, but wow, that explains it, or, you know, it doesn't make help at all. And I would put ocean acidification into this class. Fifteen years ago, nobody saw it coming. Now, it, it's going to be, you know, it's a purely chemical process. It's a bad news story. This is where I think we need to challenge ourselves. What do we not know that we're going to need to know in 10, 15 years, five years from now? So uh, I can't just leave it. I could just leave it there. But um, I'm going to put my two cents worth, and then I think it will probably be time for discussion. So some of the things that I think we need to know that we don't know very well at the moment uh, can be wrapped up into this, this question. What controls the resilience of the Strait of Georgia to change it? The Strait is going to change. You know, the future sound Sea is going to change. And what we really need to do is not try and adjust the Strait to all of these changes but to retain, in some sense, the natural ability of the strait to do its own adjusting, to improve the resilience of the strait. 
I have some ideas as to what those are. That's a whole other talk. Something we have another hour of discussion. So, uh, and in particular, this comes in when we are faced with climate change. How have past and present human activities in the strait modified how it's changed, how it uh, responds to climate change and other pressures? We've changed the way the natural system has evolved to adjust to these sorts of stresses. And does that mean that past responses no longer serve as reasonable guides to future changes or future responses? And one example is for the, perhaps the impact of novel pharmaceuticals that are being flushed into the street. I don't know what the end of the volume is, but it's horrendous day by day. And so with that, I'll um, turn it over to the convener and uh, let us handle perhaps questions. All right, thank you very much. And thank you all of you panelists for training your next to us. Okay, it is time it is time for discussion and conversation. And since it went so well last time, I am going to open the floor to everyone, uh, regardless if you're an observer or an expert or whatever color your name is. Um, with uh, the caveat that I can take that away again tomorrow if it doesn't go well. So, <laughs> hopefully we... That's right. <laughs> okay. So our questions are back here on the board or on the screen. Um, how do we do on our hypothesis and the room for recommendations? Any comments or questions for the panelists? Things that we missed? How would you modify the recommendations that you heard today? Sonia. Oh, we need to go. All right. Hi. Um, I was really interested in Sophia's work um, when she was talking about the sediment traps in the two locations in uh, Georgia Strait or the Sea. Because um, I've been involved in a project since uh, 2007 where we've actually been monitoring sanctuary, blue plankton in the Discovery Passage area, which is just north of your um, area, just the southern um, state of Georgia. And in 2010, in March, there was actually a copepod bloom that was probably about two times of anything that we've ever seen in the past five years. And so I think combining that kind of research where you've actually got the hands-on um, plankton monitoring as well as just using sediment traps is a really good thing. But the reason we were doing this is because our whole um, hypothesis of there was a mismatch between the release of a coho sand from an enhancement facility of the Camel River into that region, and we wanted to see what was going on with the zooplankton, and we were trying to figure out if we could use phytoplankton as a trigger or as an indicator of when to release the, um, the fish. Um, so we changed, we modified our release date. So we actually released three times as opposed to once, which is what had been going on historically. And um, definitely there's interannual variation in plankton and certainly a lot of structural differences too. Great. Thanks. Great. Mark, and then Alan? One of the things that uh, I found surprising, uh, and that's to, to Jack's presentation, uh, you look at the survival rate of children in relation to uh, the uh, interstigma. Uh, I know there's lots of data on marine survival for other stocks of salmon and still in the state of Georgia. Have you just started looking at those to see to what extent there is a positive or negative correlation between uh, the your index of the person that moves and the marine survival of these other fish that uh, at some time will migrate with Hawkeye within the state of Georgia when they enter the state of Georgia, not necessarily where they go after. Yeah, we were uh, real close, kind of sitting around in the mic. Okay. Um, one of my co-authors was sits on the Pacific uh, Science Commission panel, uh, technical advisory panel, and so we had an interest in the Shoko stock. I, I'm not aware of it. I mean, that stock has the, the, the rack coming out of the lake, and then there's just an accident. And Michael points here, and we really relied on Mike to bring a lot of technical information on what, what how to, how to massage that data or use that data. So I, I, I 
Maybe you could eliminate some of those other data. Or available no, I think that should be done. And in fact, I've, I've looked at, you know, I've looked at some of the stuff that, that is out there and there seems to be some correlation. It all changes about, about uh, 1989 and, and some of the big years were, uh, seem to be, big are similar years, seem to be bad years for others. And it, it, it's more problematic, I think, too, if we have different, um, uh, salt numbers of years in the salt um, water for the for the project and the project of the stuff. So it's just, you know, we started with one. Yes, uh, yes uh, my bias is of course towards salmon and I try to challenge the physical and biological oceanographers to give me some idea as to where the sweet spots are where you can get the most information uh, on local areas, but throughout the entire area of all the parameters necessary that we want to use to look at the same survival. Okay. Okay. So, Brian, next. And then, uh, Okay. Okay. I'll start with Keith, sir, if you haven't had a chance to talk yet. Right. Um, so it looks like salmon is important to religious survival, and when salmon food is important, the production of salmon food is important. Then we get the match mismatch hypothesis and phytoplankton the of production of spring bloom. And then we don't eat phytoplankton, they don't eat the small yeah. fruit that respond like liquid to spring phytoplankton bloom. And so how do we get that spring phytoplankton bloom translated to actual salmon food, and what kind of variants might be there? Three of the three of us, Brian. Yeah, so well, that's a really good question. And yeah, okay, now close to it. Um, so yeah, so, so a lot of the indices that you see in the go section, just to clarify what Brian is asking about, these are indices that correlate with the salmon survival. They're not probably what the salmon are actually eating. So in the food web, I would say that the cultural bags that you're asking about are on the order of um, at least a month, if not two months, as, um, say, the barbell fish or other carnivorous dose engine are feeding on smaller dose engine and micro dose engine, and therefore growing up to become the food for the salmon. Um, and, well, so that's my guess, though. We don't. We haven't been able to sample the larger zooplankton and the ichthyoplankton with time periods that can correlate enough to give us those life yet. I don't think. Thank you. So the question is for Jan. Um, I'm a little confused by what. Oh, okay. <laughs> so so uh, typically, um, primary productivity begins in the spring out in the ocean with upwelling moving nutrient water up into the protic zone, but in previous sound you're saying that stratification is important. What am I missing? I think even in the open ocean, when you have um, the very onset of spring, there's, there's nitrate in those surface waters. The upwelling comes into play after that, that first cold has, has taken up the nitrate in the surface layer, then upwelling continues to replace it. So that's why people look at that spring transition toward upwelling, because that's important for the, the maintained, you know, late spring through summertime production. But that, that very first when you transition from, from winter to spring, there's, there's excess nitrate in the surface layers and cruise down as well as in the outer ocean. And the, so it's the stratification keeping that nitrate warmer and in, uh, in the soil zone that is what kicks things off. Keeping the cells in the in the soil zone. Not, the nitrate's already there. Yeah, okay. right, yeah setting the cells. And I was just going to put that on the microphone. Alan, you asked a question that didn't get answered. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, obviously that's not an easy question, but it's a, it's a really good one. And I think that... The, from my perception of having studied Puget Sound as well as the Two Straits, um, I see such 
diversity in, uh, in these, these areas, the, the basins in Puget Sound, the five basins, the two straits, and just where you are in the strait. But I, I think we can exploit that to our, our benefit because we're seeing different dynamics play out there. And um, and it's sort of like what Ian was saying, you know, where things are, are similar, you know, that's telling us some of the important factors and where things are different. So, so the sweet spot in my thought is, is to get an, a solid understanding of these locations that are acting differently. Okay. I've got Christopher and then Ryan Riddle. And, uh, this is relating to your back scheduling of sort of your thousands moving up and down, which I found very impressive. Um, I have a question. It seems that this could perhaps, you know, the potential to estimate not only sort of the location of the water column, but also the length of a population or sort of a practical population of few houses including everybody with a sort of black scatter signal. Is that quantitative or is it just a qualitative observation? And the second question is, if that was true, and going to salary monitoring and maybe having that downward looking uh, backscatter approach which allow us to sort of spend a much larger uh, area for that kind of information. I think that at the moment it's uh, qualitative and so many Saito is she's trying to make it more quantitative but that includes you uh, identifying Especially the second image, you could see there was a lot of structure there, and so not all that was the copepods, I mean the, uh, the faucets. We do see, we do see, you know, we get these every day. So we see individual fish, we see the fish school by the herring. We're not sure, but I, I think that the, the faucets could be, I mean, I know people in the past, like 30 years ago, with people did see the pieces that you can see where they, did, did some quantitative estimates from the, uh, not the same instrument, but using the similar frequency. So I think it can be used uh, more quantitative and probably even, uh, as you say, on the ferries. But the DC ferries, it takes a lot of work to be able to cut a hole in the yeah. hole and uh, <laughs> you know, we have to be careful how much we ask for it before they say, you're going to be too much bother. So we can only outfit a, a ferry when it goes into dry dock. So we did the tune about burning and then by spring and then we're, we're planning one ferry on each of those three minutes. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking that we put ABC piece on the Keystone ferry and uh, on another ferry that we have in Puget Sound, we have just got the green light for it. And I wanted to know whether that could also be used to, at least, even if it's not quantitative, to qualitative, to support sampling efforts where the abundances are that then could target and sample much more intelligently than just taking a random sample. That's my question. Well, actually, I, I think you, probably you can get some quantitative information from the ABC teams. I know and Garfield had one where she modified it, so one of the beams pointed straight down, and so you, you get the back scattering layer more clearly that way, and I think it's similar frequency, so I don't see why it couldn't be uh, made a more quantitative tool. So usually that requires a lot of sampling with, uh, you know, box nets or bio nets, uh, nets and things like that. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. But the, so for one thing, the pet inlet is a great place for you to do six to try to understand the dynamics because there's a relatively, not a simple, but it's a relatively simple just like the species competition there. If you found it, it's a cause of few therapies, not too many, you know, a few other major factors. But for any MP6 survey, you can get some quantitative information, but it's only as good as the amount of net sampling you do as truthing and modeling that you put into it, and it's not easy. And you cannot develop an index that you then then apply over a space and time without a lot of background information. Thanks, Julie. Brian, what's next? So I had a question about, uh, we're talking about the early spring wounds. And that, but, and Dick, you can correct me, but we also see a summer bloom in the state of Georgia, don't we? What's the timing of this? 
Yeah, because, I mean, Dick is pointing out that there are different life histories of Chinook that are actually going out into this grade in August, and there's, well, they are doing the best outside of pink salmon probably for several years now. Now, that's the population I mentioned has dropped, but they clearly are benefiting from a second blue, which may well be related to what Sylvia was saying in terms of the influx of nutrients during the summer. And, uh, so, now, my question, though, was, in terms of capturing the sort of spatial temporal dynamics that we've heard about, we've heard about sediment traps, uh, fixed arrays, ocean gliders, vessel, vessel based sampling. Now, what does the panel think is the sort of best way to capture this? I mean, you're going to hit a, a monetary limitation at some point in time. Is it a combination of these things strategically placed? And uh, you, are you aware of any design like that that uses all these things together in some way? I don't know about on that and others can fill in. Yeah, yes, I think it is a combination. You need to understand your gradients and the gradients where change is happening. So if you are in an area that has strong vertical gradients, you need that, that vertical definition. If you are in an area where you have a lot of patchiness, you need that horizontal surface that carry your glider um, variation. You need the time rate of, of um, variation you're monitoring to, to match the time rate of the variation that's in, in your environment. So if you're in a homogenous place, maybe, you know, samples um, um, phase, you know, like monthly is okay, but if you're in a place where there's a lot of events, or your question regards something that, that is very much um, maybe potentially um, affected by events, then, then you need that high resolution timing. So typically, all of our questions overlap all of those scales. So I think that's why you see a lot of the ocean observing systems trying to to become a composite of those, of those um, strategies. And so working with Christopher and others in the future sound, we see you know the, the need for the for the ferry sampling, for the vertical profiling, for the for the precise CTDs at regular intervals, and, and seeing it all as, as a composite. Now, of course, what I've described is more expensive than if you just said I'm going to my wagon to one particular observing modality, but you're very limited in those questions that you can answer with that. So, great, thank you. Okay, and then, and then, so, and then, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with what Jen said just there, and Jen George is an ethics, you just found our public space of the English and temporarily. And so, having said the text, for example, there's a very good temporal one, but you're only in one place. And so, it's really very good to combine that with uh, our spatial space of um, In fact, I think going one step further, I was really struck at the same as people from the presentation to the Georgia Stream Line, because it became very clear that although those photographers, we look at whole bases at a time, people in communities care about their own little days. They don't actually care so much about the things that we can understand from the story that we don't miss. And so I think all these things that we were talking about today could, um, we could do, but in addition, it would be great if we could get some sort of community based monitoring at individual days to um, increase the space of because we certainly can't cover everything. But there are communities that are not care about their, um, their own local environment, and they probably will. So then it takes somebody to coordinate that and make sure the data quality are worth the So you don't care enough that it needs to be a community that needs to be Great. Great question. Okay. Well, I just want to say that in terms of characterizing spatial and temporal variability of all sorts of philosophy, modern realistic numerical simulations work extraordinarily well in studies, and they can really, they can be easily quantified to show you what is the predicted spatial and temporal, the temporal variability of current temperature, salinity, stratification, and on up to the kind of um, nutrient we can do a point of dynamics with not so good at parents. But it, anyway, but, but you can, you know, you don't have to just guess anymore. You can just ignore the work. Great, thanks. Great question. And then. Uh, okay, this is kind of a, a continuation of that question, and I think for the same, the same people. Uh, we just went through in both Houston, Sound, Aspen, and Georgia, September, October this year, 
something like 50 days of sun with no rain and no wind. I'm just wondering what impact that has on the plants and productivity in this type of year where we don't normally see anything like that. You know, those are really good questions, and, and it's exciting because now with the t stamp program, we're, we're um, going to do an annual assessment. We have our report that I showed you on 2011, so it'll be exciting to see 2012. I can tell you personally, the reason I'm only going to be here one day is because I'm teaching a class. This class has been taught eight years now out of Friday Harbor Laboratories, and we take stations and them on channel and out in the street. And we saw more diachromes, more chlorophyll than we have ever seen in any year. However, I was curious of what the water temperature would be. And I just got the graph from one of my students this, this morning over the email. And, and interestingly enough, it isn't the hottest year, the warmest year on record. So, which you might anticipate because it's not an El Nino year. So, so anyway, I think that there really are some signals, and it'll be exciting to support them out. And I'd love to hear any other signals supporting. Uh, Alex, any thoughts on that? We did, we did see some water in the signal rooms um, during some of the new tide canoes and then uh, we um, found the gay area and, and nobody really knows how far that was going. Okay. We had to send the track down to that place and we were trying to put it in the corner. Okay. Is that your next? Okay. I just remind everybody that this is a workshop and there was a focus on on Chinook Theater and why the was such a poor survival and why the survival is declining in trend. And I was uh, I encourage everyone to uh, focus the discussion a little more on, on addressing those issues. What is actually killing and should not call them still. How do they actually die? <coughs> Why are they dying uh, so much in the uh, say the first four to eight weeks? Uh, why are why are um, and happy fish doing not so and not as well as uh, wild fish? Um, and once and why are and once we begin to understand at least have some idea that the hypotheses are, what is that do about it? And the whole idea of being here is that some of us think that there is an opportunity to improve the survival either by releasing accurate fish at different times or at least understanding something about the causing the mortality. And the idea is that if we can improve the survival, we can of course improve the location. And you know, to be to be oppressed and maybe blood about it, um, there's an economic Sides of this meeting. We're not here because we're academics. We're here because we've been trying to solve a problem. And I'm suggesting that maybe for some of the remaining discussion, that we try to keep a little more focus on what's causing the mortalities and what we can do about it. Thank you. We're going to talk to you. That's particularly close to this question. It would be off on another topic for half an hour. So I'll, I'll, I'll shoot. I'll, I'll take my observations on this last session. Um, it sounded like the discussion was heading towards the idea that uh, productivity moves more towards the surface, like it's, it's less vertically uh, integrated, it's more, it's more compact in the top, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's what I'm observing. So, is, is, you know, what is the impact of that possibly? If I'm totally wrong, but I'm not that much so. Is that a wrong observation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, Parker's data shows that there was increased stratification, but I don't think. So Christopher has a poster in the back of the room, and it shows, as he mentioned earlier, decreasing in chlorophyll. But I don't know if we know that much about really where it is or what the reason for that decrease in chlorophyll is. And, and he brought up the whole species issue. We're, the folks like Nate and, and Parker and I were trying to understand 
you know, are there some physical drivers to the change and, and how can that um, affect the timing of the room, not so much the location. I was really thinking timing because we're home is not that theory. And, and that works for some of them as well, you know, and they're, of course, we think they're going to be an important factor. I don't think we know anything about the, the depth distribution of the of the blooms or whether that would really matter. I think it's more the, the quantity and the timing. Well, I think the quantity is funny. I think um, we're not just saying the sandbox, we're talking about the technology and talking about different and quantity. Something that not to figure out what's going on and what we're actually doing. Our Okay, do you want to respond? I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, a couple a couple different points. One, um, going back to the connection between visible oceanography and, and fish production, uh, it's true. The American model has done a great job of going out to phytoplankton and to zooplankton, uh, insofar as the zooplankton departments were uh, designed to, to target uh, species that were relevant to the fish. That hasn't always worked. And then this, this big mismatch is inconsistent uh, between zooplankton and fish directly. So to me, that speaks to the notion that we need to be very methodical about getting direct information for the zooplankton matter and the fish performance uh, through time and space directly. And in terms of the vertical information, um, it's, we need to know what's happening at, at all these different dimensions. Uh, but I just realized that uh, it has to be to where those prey are available for the fish. And for uh, juvenile sound lines in particular, they're very surface oriented. Upper, 10, uh, upper 15 meters of the water column initially, and then they kind of use the upper 30 meters or so as, as they move uh, a little later into the growing season. But somehow, those production processes have to lead to that availability uh, in that zone. They're also predominantly daylight feeders, which in this temperate environment is important because we do have darkness parts of the year. So for at least the juvenile salmon that are feeding on zooplankton and other small prey, they're predominantly feeding during daylight. When we move up one trophic level, their predators are probably more effective during these dawn dusk periods uh, than they are during daylight. So we've got a mismatch in terms of the temporal scales that are relevant to uh, salmon growth versus the temporal scale that may be relevant to near-term survival and then yet another scale that, that's relevant to uh, eat the late mortality. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I wanted to go back to Brian's question to Julie about how do you connect up something like plankton dynamics to the things that juvenile salmon are eating and I mean, one thing we haven't talked too much about that David was getting there, I think, was some concentrated feeding opportunities that are happening on maybe really small spatial scales and temporal scales that are probably driven by some combination of the weather, tidal cycles. Um, there are you know, certain places within the Salish Sea that are hot spots for feeding across multiple trophic levels. So it may be more complicated than just trying to track the abundance of certain tropopods or, or even forage fish because it's, it's about these sort of concentrated feeding opportunities that might also be good for low predation. Okay. Want that? Want that one? Oh, okay. Want that? Getting more interesting now, and we have an excellent question as well as you were in this. Yes, very clever, nice. Um, so, you know, there's, as I said earlier, there, there is a number of marine survival time series that are available that can be used to explore already the potential linkages between some of the physical and biological. Uh, 
leader from the lower level to the upper level, level. And I'm surprised that I haven't seen too many analyses trying to relate to the country Sophia and get four years of data, and hopefully you can relate this to marine survival in the future years. Uh, I didn't get from this man or Jan, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many years of data you had on the timing and how the planting production, aside from the fact that you had three years of data there, I'm not sure if you had more years before and after that, but if you do have those data, why not try to see if there is any relationship between the marine survival of coho or shinnok or silver and timing the magnitude of the fire uh, planting zone. See if it matters. How far down the have to go. Uh, there's obviously a, a trade off to make at some point between how much detail you need to, to get. Like, we're not going to go to the molecules necessarily in the ocean, so we have to go beyond this to, to relate the factors that are potentially driving those that are running survival and see whether or not we can do anything about it. Uh, but we have to look at those correlations to find I absolutely agree. Yes. Your point is a really good one. Um, the problem is I don't know of a funding entity to write to to secure funding to fund the key personnel, whether they're students or technicians, to do the kind of analysis you're talking about. I mean, it's not something that they do in their plan. So, so I think that that's really lacking in our area, at least it is in the state, I know, because we, you write something like that to the NSF and they'll say, no, this is too, you know, parochial, this is very specific to future STEM. You write something to, you know, some of the local possibilities and it's like, okay, well, here's 10K. I mean, we just don't have a coordinated body to fund local research for these sorts of things. So, so those really, that really does have a long time period. It was put in in 2005. It's out there still now. We could definitely do that analysis. It was put in for a different reason that it was funded besides marine survival. And I guess I'd have to say that the whole reason that you got me as a biological oceanographer participating in this group for free is because I think this is really interesting and we'd love to do this. It's just mm -hmm. research costs money. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I have um, Ralph and then Dave and then Christopher and then Lori. Am I missing anyone? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Mike. Okay, and then um, this is a time check. It is just about 4 o'clock. I'm just checking this Brian. I'm going to try to wrap this discussion question if I sign up for a reporter after. Go. You guys can help me with that. Oh, I know. You want to do this one. Okay, go. Thanks, uh, Michael. I just want to go. This is my recognition that you took the microphone away from Christopher and gave it to me, so thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, so it's my. Three quick points. One is I think that the conversation this afternoon seems to be zeroing in around um, food quality. And it, it think it's right that we have um, dead fish walking around in the same sea. Um, it's not
the food web or the ecosystem data in the context of the physical information that we're generating. And the last thing is um, the data. If we were to put together a joint program that would, would include these sort of complicated biological and physical relationships that we're talking about today, who's going to, how are we going to intelligently um, take care of that information and make it available to everybody who's trying to make decisions about what's going on with them? Any, any responses to all of Okay, so I'm going to go on to Ian and then um, Julie and then Nick. Certainly with respect to the modeling, uh, in my view, it's, uh, it's relatively inexpensive. You just need someone with a computer, basically. What is expensive with the modeling is, is I call it data archaeology. It's gathering up the data that exists to put into the model. My thinking is that should be the first thing that's funded. Because that, even if the model would be wrong, but what it will do <laughs> is it will show you what you don't know that you should know. And it helps to target, field work is really expensive, so you can do a whole bunch of field work and it may or may not interesting. But if you have a model and you know what the key missing bits are, field work can target those and hopefully move the model forward. So uh, I would suggest that modeling is the thing where you start, not at the end. It should be more than Grumpy Carl Walters and the gratitude. This should be a, a, a know that then everything else but you. Right. Do it. And there should be more than one kind of modeling starting and continuing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to make a very similar point um, and say that part of the success of the GoVet program that Michael um, suggested that we were basing some of the structure on was that the modeling started concurrent with me with a lot of field programs. So that by the time we had good model structures in place, we were able to start feeding in data, which then informed the model of how to change and the sampling of how to change. And it was pretty successful. It was a big deal on. Um, but I, I also want to take this moment of my microphone time to make a point that wasn't very clear earlier in our presentation, which is that we're, we have huge data gaps, obviously, that we know of. And um, just to, I think, a little bit answer one of Mark's questions about how long these time series are that we have and what can we can start doing. For the Bill Jensen portion, we have zero time series in Puget Sound, except what I call some one-off studies here and there that were maybe a year or two in the canals and stopped, and 10 years later, a year or two in Main Basin. We just don't have any of the systems and data that we need to plug in to models. But the models will probably start right away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the spray tells it to get it into the model. Yeah. Well, it tells you that it's very because I'm a model and, and you don't just plug data in the model. It's not a way. <laughs> but you have to actually sort of describe the testing of hypothesis. You have to regulate a question in a very quantitative way in order to have the data in the model communicate. So I think it's really. Um, yeah, I'd also follow up on something Jack said about using models to learn about the systems. And one thing that I think is a a high priority item is to use circulation models to reconstruct historical variability in circulation. But this has been done for the Northeast Pacific, and people have learned a lot of really interesting things, like the NPGO, this whole sort of climate mode of the Northeast Pacific. Virtually everything that we've learned about what it means for salinity and nutrients and transport has come from. Uh, this historical simulation where you take the observed wind for the last 50 years and you use that as a boundary condition on an ocean circulation model that you have confidence that the right dynamics and Parker and his 
acquirers have been working really hard on the state of sea model, getting it to a point where it's getting close, I think, to be ready to do something like this, do a historical time cast, and, uh, and people in British Columbia have worked on similar things like Mike Foreman. But I think having that historical circulation um, simulation will provide a whole bunch of new data sets for people to ask different questions of and start to correlate different aspects of the, of the actual water properties and the circulation features within the sound to things like rain survival rates. And now we've got wind, we've got surface temperature, someone in a few places. Those are the only long time series that exist. And it, it doesn't integrate up to what is actually going on below the surface. So. I just wanted to say that we're in a better time frame <laughs> of, of, our, of our human evolution for, for that in the sense of data information systems. And I showed Dan Uses one that's called the OVIS, the Ocean Biological um, Information System. And I think having um, Having the ability to really put together some of the diverse data sets <coughs> there, I think we can leverage that. Great. Okay, are okay. you okay? Are you okay? Any questions first? And then Lori and Mike and Mel are Alan. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Hi, uh, feeling, Mel and Polly. <laughs> This morning, we heard a bunch of fish squeezers repeatedly say sometime around 1989, 1990, there was this tremendous change in the Strait of Georgia. And I was listening to the presentations this afternoon and thinking, okay, one of these ocean officers is going to come up with something that happened around 1989, 1990. Come up, here it comes, here it comes. And we're all going to shake hands, go and have a research plan and a sensible hypothesis. But all I ever saw was one thing about stratification in 1980 which was not at all what I was expecting. So how come we do not have a link between what a whole bunch of fish readers observed what I stated about their observations this morning and what was happening here? Because that, to me, would be the first sort of level of accessible mechanism that we could go after. Uh, so how do we uh, try to reconstruct that observed history with uh, physical uh, chemical and um, hydrogeographic data uh, that we already do have to handle on. Just briefly, I did say 1989 was a pivotal year. I've got one foot in fish and one foot in algae, and I'm surprised. All right, perfect. Give me one. Well, I would just say that I think this is the whole point of this workshop, you know, prior to coming here, I didn't know from the 60s or the 40s or but I did know that we were supposed to figure out a hypothesis of what could be the bottom up to a fourth thing that we gave you an example of that and showed you the sensitivity both in terms of long term as well as event sorts of things and show that these can have a profound impact. So well, what I found disturbing was that you guys by yourself didn't go to something that we had observed and it wouldn't have been useful of us. <laughs> but we aren't testing for it, but that's part of the, the hypothesis, so I think that's worth taking a go for. Great. Okay. Um, I'd like to address a discussion that we had before. Um, it's not as dire in the U.S. as I think it might have seemed. You have long-term monitoring going on in Puget Sound, and so you have some variables like temperature, salinity, density structure, and nutrients that are fairly well covered, and we have long-term uh, time series of that. So it totally falls apart as anything that is super structure. And so that basically I wanted to rectify that. And so it's the gap we have information here, and we have, you know, sort of declining fish stuff. 
and bringing that together. And um, just, you know, I do a lot of all the way, you know, but in our long term, 13 years sort of monitoring, we see an integrated uh, or an increase in integrated uh, floor for over the 0 to 50 meters and an increase in transmissivity. So the water gets here, both sensors, it may be and everything just sound. So coming back to your melancholy, I think there is something to start a discussion, uh, you know, a subject to start it, so one could be some high interpretation and food availability. So right. that's the only point I want to make. All right. I have a couple quick comments. Um, one in regards to Dick's comment, I, I would argue that we also don't know when the pressure dies. Right? So it's not just where or, or what is going on, but when is that happening. Um, one thing on those tanks and toxins for bottom up, um, I didn't see anything with that having to do with jellyfish. And I was just wondering, are they not an issue to the sound off the coast? Um, they end up being a huge biomass in it huge amount of energy goes up in the delicates, which obviously commercially are very important, but, but uh, food webs don't always behave in ways that are commercially valuable. And then finally, um, I think this idea of what we know we don't know, or, or uh, however Ian uh, phrased it, that the physical models are great, and physics is really easy to do. Biomod biological models are really, really tough, and biological systems are incredibly difficult to predict. And I think the best example of that is the California Current. We've got a great model, shows what's going on, and then we got invaded by a humble wind in 2009, and nobody saw that coming. And they were this huge biomass. They ate all kinds of stuff. Um, it, we never saw it. And I don't know what the next humble squid equivalent is going to be, but I guarantee you it's out there somewhere. Great. Thanks, Laura. Sorry about Mike. And then now and then Alan and Corey, and that's probably what we can. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just, just, you know, just, just the jellyfish question. Um, so, again, we don't really have time periods of jellyfish in the state of town, but they are obviously hugely important, especially in some basins like in Houston Alley. We get overrun with everything from sea little Medusi up to the Jacqueline and uh, they have to be immensely <coughs> important. So Okay, so I have a question for anybody that can enlighten me, but um, sure we've seen this decline in this period of years that we picked that sort of a longer series going back to 80 or whatever, but, uh, you know, we had a, a, a change in conditions around the late 90s, uh, 90s uh, 98 was the big Alina, but then it, the, the Ocean temperatures dropped, and we saw a huge bump in survival in uh, coastal stocks and straight away the Puka. And then we think we saw a signature in Puget Sound uh, in the watershed that uh, I work in. For instance, we saw a very large escapement uh, around 2004, 2003. And then there was this big pronounced crash after that from 2005 onwards. And I, I looked at a bunch of hatchery statement data, for instance, and uh, it's not all the same, but you can pick probably around 80% of the hatchery statements during that time to show this pronounced crash. And then there's several that are going upward. And uh, now lately we've gone back into sort of a cooling period again, and we see this year finally in Pink Sound all of a sudden a lot more cold than we expected. And they're very small, they're, they're, they're undersized. They're, I haven't got the size data on yet, but everywhere I've heard there are very small fish that they survive, and you know they're coming in like double the forecasted numbers. So you know that seems to be correlated again to this cooling period that we've temporarily gone back into at least for the last couple of years, and, and you know it's, it's showing up on the coast sooner. And I was you know kind of wondering if it was going to ever have any effect at all on the sound because. Uh, like two years ago, we saw the lowest coho in the hatchery run that, that I oversee ever. And like this year, um, in one day, a thousand times that many fish, uh, 2009 brood years, came in through a crack in a fish ladder rack in one day. And so, you know, it's obvious to me, we don't even have an estuary or anything, we're releasing right into the marine environment, even though it could be 
competition and whatnot out there that there are, um, you know, serious limitations to uh, availability of food for these fish and their survival is severely impacted. And it's, it's, I guess I'm, I'm making the point, first of all, somebody could comment on the fact that when you break it down the last dozen years or so, we've had sort of an up and then we've got a major crash. We've seen this throughout Puget Sound. If you look around, you'll see it not everywhere. And so that's my second point is that there's a sub-regional effect on this that we really need to incorporate into our thinking. So, um, I see other hatcheries, for instance, in South Sound that are doing quite well. And uh, whereas North Sound particularly is, is done very poorly, and I think this is an opportunity for us to study this. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm looking at one of the hypotheses here, and it seems to capture what everybody's been saying. Where you're talking about um, a zooplankton and uh, forage fish monitoring program in conjunction with juvenile cell monitoring, and in the end, you can take this information. Um, and uh, develop a, you know, a sort of a NOAA-style uh, Oregon, Washington coastal uh, program like uh, they've done where they've, they've incorporated all the types of data, you know, juvenile fish and cell sites and all that. But none of it's been done collectively together in the sun. And if we did have that, I think right now when we see these big differences that are going on, we, what we don't have is that suite of uh, concurrent data that would maybe explain why these sub-regional differences. So sub-regional effects, the need to do zooplankton and fish monitoring together, and I guess I just see these big swings in, um, in survival that have happened in the last 12 years that we haven't really talked about, but it's right as we speak right now, this fall, we're getting coho again, and we saw it in 1999 uh, to 2001 that out migration years have been affected, you know, adult returns that came in after that, and I haven't heard anything about that. Okay. Is, um, you guys have any response to that? There's a lot, I guess I would just say that we hear time and time again, so it's monitoring is important. You know, we've been trying to get something like this off the ground for a long time, and the states have, have not succeeded. And even Christopher, you said long term, but 13 years, that's not long term. We, we really, in your horizon, 1989, if my math is right, it's outside of 13 years. <laughs> so I think, you know, we, we face some, some big hurdles, but using the combination of models and observation, I really think we can get Great. Now, okay. and then Corey, and then I think we have to turn it over to Brian. Okay, I just want to follow up on a comment that uh, Nate had made about trying to be strategic about the uh, lower sample and looking for black spots and things like that. And I think very clear, you know, as a, myself as a fisherman and you know, biologist, fisherman biologist, and biologist, when you go out in the ocean, it's not a situation where you see fish everywhere. They are, are concentrated in hot spots and seeds cut up. And it's very clear to me that the uh, um, these, you know, if, you, if you follow these fish, these fish know where they go. They're, they're looking for those places. And one way you can you can uh, uh, track that is like uh, poop in a diaper. Right? Sorry, it's trying to kill me. Are these fish? Are these uh, fishermen? And you know, these are guys that have rockets that go to the back decades. Um, and it takes you know, to consider the spatial temporal changes that happen over time and over the last decade. I think it's just looking at the rockets that's across, across the uh, majority basin area. Uh, I mean, there's still fishermen that are fishing today that uh, have these rockets that are 40, 50 years old. They have probably some great information in terms of telling us where, where the rock and where these fish are residing at the times of the year. I'm sure it's the same thing as we just found. But you know, even you thought about capturing and the knowledge of scientists, I think we should probably consider that for fishing as well. Okay. 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 Okay.
historical records uh, in the 70s and uh, based on some uh, you know, estimations of uh, basically uh, day night differences in trawling, it appears that there's increased frequency in jellyfish from the 70s to the 70s. Okay. 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 Okay, I have actually two quick comments. <laughs> um, Mel mentioned about concentration, and, and actually when we're talking about juveniles, one of the things that's really amazing in our juvenile surveys in both the early summer and in September is that there are salmon everywhere. So this year in 2012, of maybe 230 sets that were made between 0 and 60 meters, we had maybe two sets that had no salmon, juvenile salmon in them. So there's, there's differentiation in what species in different areas of the strait, but they're, they're everywhere. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, the second thing is McFarland and Demis and maybe Jackie wrote a number of, number of years ago a paper asked the fish. And I think that this comes back to the discussion we're having here. If we're seeing some changes in what's occurring in the marine environment, we're seeing some good years for they're fishing the ocean for not so good years. Some stocks that are doing better, some stocks that are not doing so well. So that's a place to start, is ask the fish, you know, what's going on in that really strong year? What happened in those years where the survival wasn't so great? Is it consistent between Puget Sound and the state of Georgia, or are there differences? And what does the oceanography look in those, like in those years? We know that there's mortality occurring in that early marine period, but we can't answer why that's occurring. Is there, what do we need to measure to determine the health of the fish at that potential time? Can we measure something? And I don't want to keep on measuring that fish. I want to know what the answer is, why they're dying. Okay. So. Thanks, guys. Okay. So I want to say, first of all, thank you very much to our panelists, as well as you for a great discussion. Um,